presentation for from the speakers. I believe Clay made a very nice synthesis of the subject, uh, showing the complexity of the system to handle this problem. And of course, he also present what the Inter Academy Medical Panel are doing in this area. So I believe it's very rich presentation. And then Gary present what the WHO are doing uh, in research to collaborate in this area and present several cases of success in this area that ensuring that it's essential to have research to really implement the health, universal health coverage. And then Paula present a very nice example of one country, how they are organizing the, the universal health coverage. He analyzed different aspects, the physical accessibility, the financial affordability, and the acceptability, and also all the challenge to implement this system in Nigeria. So I believe we have plenty of subject for the discussion. So it's open for the floor. Please, then, lady first. <laughs> Uh, I wanted to ask Liming. It was very, um, I see it as a very serious problem, what you mentioned about the diseases that, uh, microbial diseases which now have resistance to antibiotics. Uh, I wanted to ask you if the IAMP has suggestions for a strategy in research to specifically uh, to be able to combat this. And if I may ask another question for Gary. Um, I find it very interesting, your institute, where you're working on research uh, for tropical diseases. Um, I would like to ask you maybe to go into a little bit more detail, which tropical diseases, and if you are also working on uh, the diseases transmitted by water. Okay, thank you, uh, Catherine, for that very, very good uh, question. I think it's a very important question you've asked. What can IMP do, and basically what can scientists do about this uh, emerging problem, and it's going global anyway, of antimicrobial resistance in the, uh, the, the hospitals and so, off, so on. Can you hear me? Yeah, this is better. Sorry. I think basically there have to be two, two strategies. One is uh, more research on antibiotics and uh, new antimicrobials. Um, the, the point is a lot of pharmaceuticals have actually shifted their interest out of antimicrobials because I've mentioned earlier, there's not much money to be made there. There's more money to be made in the chronic diseases like diabetes, hypertension, heart disease and so on. So the focus of many uh, companies have been on that. And I think we need to, to get a refocus back on developing new antimicrobials. And uh, whether scientists could uh, join forces with them to, to, to work in this area to develop it, uh, whether governments could encourage it by perhaps uh, subsidizing or providing more grants in that area, because obviously <coughs> developing a new drug, a new antimicrobial, have along the way a lot of situations where they do not meet with success, then there's, uh, there is... Uh, uh, research loss, money, and so on. So I think there has to be a more uh, proactive way of developing more antimicrobials. And perhaps also look at other aspects, developing of vaccines and so on to, to, to perhaps protect the population against some of the serious uh, infections. Um, uh, so that, that's, that's basically one strategy. The other is, I suppose, to call upon um, medical practitioners to be more to to be more involved in terms of developing uh, antimicrobial policies in the hospitals, 
so that the usage of antibiotics is more rationalized, so that you do not have so many an, uh, resistant organisms developing. And I think this can be extended further, that there should be more dialogue between um, the medical services and the veterinary services and in agriculture as well, in the use of antibiotics uh, in agriculture as well as in the, the, and farm animals and so on, because that does, to some extent, uh, affect the development of antimicrobial resistance as well. Really, it, it's not just neglected diseases themselves, but also the focus is on infectious diseases of poverty. And that's an important distinction because uh, some of the, like um, even HIV, can be considered to be more or less um, not really an issue of inequality, but subgroups and subpopulations, etc., who suffer from sort of un unintended isolation from that or because of the poverty. Uh, we focus on that. So um, malaria, TB, and 17 um, neglected diseases that are really on WHO's list and you know, sleeping sickness or onchocerciasis or dengue, et cetera, et cetera. So there are about 17 neglected diseases. So all of them, but again, the focus is on sort of equity issues and the focus is on issues of um, who doesn't get covered or who doesn't get reached um, and, and how that sort of can be improved. Um, in terms of the transmission through water, uh, you know many of them are uh, because of the vector um, and how it transmits, etc. Uh, and it will also focus not only sort of the environment part that way, but also sort of the animal transmission. So one world, one health approach is really something that we encourage. We even have a sp special program that is called Vectors, Environment, and Society. And so the social and, and, and environmental issues have to be really part of the research conducted. So um, I, hopefully that answers uh, your question. I mean, it's not easy, uh, but um, that approach is being used um, more and more now. Um, I guess that uh, all of us are aware uh, of that recent Ebola outbreak, and I think that outbreak is really putting the finger into into the wounds, and uh, is really uh, demonstrating uh, the problems uh, we have with healthcare in developing countries, like underestimating uh, of a specific disease, uh, not having uh, produced uh, drugs against the disease because uh, there is not, an, let's say, an economic pressure behind and all the other problems. Uh, could you just uh, elaborate a bit? Uh, I think it's a very good example uh, to be discussed here and uh, to show all the problems uh, with healthcare. Sure. Um, it's probably not a secret that Ebola is not a health issue. It's a, it's a poverty issue. So really, it's not, I mean, of course it's a health issue, but the cause and fundamental problem that has occurred in the three countries has nothing to do with the actual control of disease. It has to do with the poverty and how educational levels, etc. Because we had this disease in other countries where it was easily contained in no time. It's a perfect example, but this is what TDR did for 40 years. It had to pick um, diseases that nobody wanted to pay for or drugs or things like that. So I think increasingly there is more um, focus on this with a lot, as I, as I showed in terms of the amount of uh, funds, but it's still uh, not um, there and public health is invisible when it works. Public health is only visible when it doesn't work. So only when it doesn't work people notice public health. So it's the mindset change of continuing to support things that may or may not be immediately in, in your sort of vicinity. And, and that, that, that is not an easy thing to do in a high or low or middle income country, regardless of the setting. So that's my two cents. I'll agree entirely with uh, what Gary has said. And um, the success of Nigeria in being able to contain Ebola 
was predicated on the fact that the government was prepared to roll out all the publicity material, advocacy, education, and all that uh, in a very short time. And there was um, a much larger number of practitioners in Nigeria than in these other countries where the disease is ranging. We, the health practitioners and the government don't often agree in my country. And as I spoke, I said to somebody, part of our luck was that the uh, government hospitals were shut down when the first case of uh, Ebola came because um, there was a dispute between the government and the health work, 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 workforce resulting in closure of these hospitals. So the only places that the first case of Ebola could have gone to was a private medical uh, organization. And these tend to be generally more, more efficient and more proficient in whatever they do. He was also, were well, lucky, a diplomat. So he was um, uh, whistled through immigration without mingling with a lot of people. There was a courier person from his office who came to meet him, uh, sh shook and embraced him, and got Ebola that way and also died <coughs> after being looked after. So um, essentially, like I said to someone else again, you ask in Lagos or in Nigeria today, a four-year-old, what do you do? What's Ebola? They all know, and they know what to do. Uh, that's in contrast to the United States. Pardon me, those who come from there, where if they see you coming from Uganda and you arrive at the airport, some people will move away because the moment you mention Africa, as I said in the uh, introduction to my speech, uh, you are already labeled as uh, a person with Ebola. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, congratulations is in, in this uh, very nice talk that, uh, that you gave. Um, I would like to continue with the question regarding resistance to, antibio to antibiotics. I'm especially interested in all these new resistance that are, that are coming towards, uh, for instance, bet beta-lactamics, you know, the new generation of beta-lactamics. Uh, that is the best that we have in the world regarding antimicrobes. However, uh, every day that you, you follow the Every day that you follow the, uh, the scientific literature, you find that there is resistance to a new strain of such bacteria. And um, I was wondering uh, if you uh, know of organizations that they are interested not only in, in the knowledge of the resistance to these antibiotics, but to the synthesis or to the extraction or the purification of, of, uh, of uh, molecules that could be used against these resistance bacteria. As far as I'm concerned, uh, I know that there are some, um, some um, institutions, scientific institutions, that they are uh, working very close to to extracts, extracts of plants that comes from a biodiverse area, they are uh, very promising to to these uh, to these problems, and especially, you know, uh, uh, very promising regarding the control of, of very resistant bacteria. So, therefore, perhaps uh, the the uh, attention. Of, uh, of, of these groups should be uh, to this, uh, to this um, um, work that it's been done in different areas, and especially in the ones that they are uh, countries that they are very quite biodiverse. Thank you. Well, um, I'm, not a, I'm not a microbiologist or a virologist, so I wouldn't know the specific details of uh, groups that are working on resistant organisms. Uh, but I do know that there are groups working on this, and I think there are fairly big uh, interest 
research groups working in Europe and uh, collaborative groups working working on uh, antibiotic resistant organisms and ways to tackle them as well as development of new strategies. I mean, they, they, they do exist. And the idea is that science always keeps an open mind as to different strategies to tackle problems when they arise. And certainly the, the, the testing of new forms of therapies, which may not be antibiotics by the by the true definition of the word, has also been explored, and some of them have been successful, I would think. I mean, like malaria, for example, we have chloroquine-resistant malaria that are now sensitive to other forms of uh, drugs that have been developed from natural resources, and that has been uh, very, very successful. So I think there's, there's hope as long as science moves on with an open mind, recognizing problems that need to be solved and uh, setting their minds on it. So, I mean, it's just a, a, a general conceptual statement. I'm sorry I can't name the exact groups, but perhaps some of the other panel members know the exact groups they're working on this. Yeah, not an exact names, but I mean, it's not new. Uh, like artemisinin for malaria, is, is, it comes from, from natural plants. So it's, it, we use that. Uh, the, the, the issue most of the time is how the natural, naturally occurring um, uh, sort of chemicals in natural environment are tested and done properly. And the bad sort of the, sort of the gray area is when it's used with no evidence or not enough evidence or not enough science is done to prove its efficacy and it's used and then, and then it doesn't go anywhere or it doesn't lead somewhere. But I think now, as, as Lai Meng said, there is more openness to that, both by pharmaceutical companies and public funders to look beyond chemical, but again, with the proper uh, trials and testing to actually prove its efficacy, uh, because that, that, that's the key part of, uh, of, the, uh, of the result of that. Okay, I, I want to bring back uh, the, we have excellent presentations. I just want to push you a bit further on the topic that we have of the question, core question of poverty and what kind of science should we be doing to address that. Now, uh, uh, our colleague from Nigeria and a colleague from Malaysia both pointed to something that's quite serious and it needs to be explored further. One is this non-Western medical systems. Now, uh, I'm not just talking of quacks. I mean, there are quacks in the faith-based systems and there are enough quacks in the scientific medical system. I mean, we had a case of the medical association president who took part in a quack operation of transplanting a rib to make a thumb. The patient died, and rather than have him suspended, the entire medical community sort of banded to defend him. You know, we have these cases. So it's not just faith-based systems that are in the quack business. Huh? And uh, <clears throat> the four, three systems that we really have, and this is important because uh, the rock star prime minister of India, Narendra Modi, has now just set up a semi-ministry or sub-ministry or department uh, for one of these traditional medical systems, which is Ayurveda. Okay? The other is the Tibetan medical system. And the third one we have is what, what is called Yunani, I believe that's Greek Islam system. There are three systems. Each one of them has a history of at least 1,500 to 3,000 years. Okay? And why this is important, I asked the prime ministers, one of the party guys, uh, why this was necessary to set up, <clears throat> because I know the resistance that's coming from the uh, formal medical sector on this. And the answer was that uh, these traditional systems are systems used most by the poor. And the reason they are used most by the poor is because they are, A, cheap. Most of them are run by voluntary charities and uh, things like that, which provide almost free medical system, but not completely free, there's something there. And most of the poor use it, uh, where doctors, even barefoot doctors, are not reaching um, remote villages. These guys are there. So that's the first thing. Now, my question to you is, I have found out that, uh, and I have seven members of uh, my family. I'm not a doctor, but seven members of mine are, and uh, family gatherings become pretty heated on this. Uh, why is the medical profession or medical association, uh, you know, 
shutting out this more, you answered a little bit, but no, there isn't enough. There's a huge resistance. And medical associations are behaving more like trade unions, uh, you know, cutting out uh, the other science, rather than doing what you've suggested, which is actually you know, the, a sort of a falsification, testing, verification, all that sort of stuff. And the second is, this is more serious, uh, a colleague from Malaysia mentioned that only 10% of global spending on health research is de devoted to diseases that account for 90% of global disease burden. I also read somewhere, correct me if I'm wrong, that you know, something like 80% of the normal diseases that people suffer, common cold, diarrhea, whatever, whatever, can be solved with medicine that's so cheap that just about any country could manufacture it uh, anywhere, okay, most of them. Now, the problem is there is a very dangerous and incestuous alliance, we see that every day, between pharmaceutical companies and doctors, which is actually raising the price of medical care so high that it is becoming unaffordable to the poor. And that's why the poor are shifting more and more to traditional systems. Okay. Now, what are we doing as scientists and what are we doing as a science community to be able to address this question? I think this is a very important question. And uh, uh, at least the one that relates to the traditional medical practice. There are very many areas of research uh, trying to analyze the contents of what people use, and a number of them have produced significant materials that could be tested and are being tested. There is also the problem of resistance, usually, of cooperation attempts by medical people, uh, so-called Western medical people to ask these people for information that can relate to their practices so that they can be better scientifically documented and analyzed <coughs> and tested. Uh, in every country that I have asked from, there's always this resistance. They want to take away our job and they want to do this. There is also the third one of faking and adulteration. Uh, people come with psychosomatic symptoms and things like that. In some countries, some of these drugs are available off the counter. They mix these things into their content of whatever they have. There are documented results of this. But on the basis of all this kind of thing, the IAMP has recently started a uh, program whereby they want to evaluate. I think that was the word we used. Uh, evaluating traditional medical practice, not just the medicines, but also the practice. And there is a, a seminar, workshop, conference being planned later next year in Beijing, sponsored and spearheaded by the Chinese Academy of uh, Engineering. Uh, uh, and uh, so, and there are other groups like that. In Nigeria, for example, there is a whole institute devoted to natural medicine, national, uh, national, natural and traditional medicine institute, headed by a very highly trained scientist who is a PhD in pharmacology and all that kind of thing. They have laboratories where they can analyze things. Very many universities are in their departments of sociology and similar departments cooperating with traditional medicines uh, practitioners to try and distill out what exactly they are doing. But it's an extremely difficult job. And what I was saying when I criticized my most recent Minister of Health was that it is not something you just wake up one day and say you are going to set up a university for these people. It needs a kind of analysis so that progress can be made towards and the reason it has taken so long, I believe, is that there is a resistance. Let me just end this side of the question with this um, example. I was asked by my institute to organize a seminar on sickle cell disease. 
And there is a doctor, a traditional doctor based in Lagos who has a website and is on the radio <laughs> and on television saying he can cure sickle cell disease. So I wrote to him on his website. I said, we are doing this conference. Could you please come and present some of the data so that we can understand what you are doing? Of course, I wrote it. I simply said, for liaison. And that means nothing to anybody. He wrote back through the email to say that the science he's doing is so complicated that it takes people with a lot of knowledge and all that kind of thing to understand it. So I wrote back to say that I'm a humble hematologist. I have a PhD in some area of biochemistry uh, genetics, and uh, I'm also a fellow of this and that, so I think I might be able to understand his uh, medicine and science. And uh, <coughs> he then wrote back that, no, I wasn't qualified. So I said, if you're not qualified, why don't you just write us an abstract of what you have been doing? And that was the last I heard from him. Uh, there is this wall between us and them. It's not a matter of trade unionism, I think, on the basis of the Western doctors. It is just a fear, I believe, that <coughs> these people are going to take their job. Finally, there is a very good story of somebody who disclosed what he was using to treat patients with sickle cell disease and it was analyzed by a National Institute for Pharmaceutical Disease and Research and Development. A drug came out of it, which is being analyzed and has been licensed for use in Nigeria. And it's being tried to see whether we can be taken outside of the country. <laughs> it is said to be advertised. You certainly cannot put yourself and say, I can do this and do the other. Whereas traditional practitioners are not bound by this kind of thing. As I said before, they're on the radio, they're on television, most of the things are untested, and that's the problem, uh, basically. Um, it is used mostly by poor people. There's no <coughs> doubt at all about that. Clearly, if I have malaria, I will go for a test on it. I won't go and consult people who make some scarification and things like that. The world has changed. As a young man, <coughs> I watched two of my sips from my mother die from post measles bronchopneumonia with hindsight. What my mother asked me to do when they fell sick was to go to the medicine man of the village. I will walk there, give the complaint, he will send me with some medication, and then if it didn't improve over two days, I'll go back again, there'll be another medication. So again, most of us have this kind of background. We know how it works. It's not to say that it does not work, but it needs to be critically looked into so that we do not complete and say that, okay, it's been done for centuries, therefore it must work. No, that's not the science that we want to do. We want to be told, this is what we do. Let's go and use our own methods, see whether they will work or they will not work. So it's not a matter of uh, trade unionism. Um, there is no doubt that some of the systems that they use are very useful. The way they look after people with mental illness, for example, short of the chaining and the physical flogging, Keeping them within the community was pioneered and refined by the late Dr. Lambo, who was Deputy Director General of the WHO, by creating an arrow village, whereby these vagrants, as they were called, roaming the streets, psychotics, were asked to live in a community, and they were looked after by their own people, and a lot of them got better. So that was translated from the traditional system onto the uh, uh, medical system, onto the Western system. I couldn't stay in our village when I had to go and do the psychiatric posting there. But it's on, 50, 60 years on, and has been replicated in very many other countries. I think that's all I want to say. Thank you.
you want to? I mean, to? I can add yeah. to what uh, Fola has said. I think what he said is correct. I think the, the problem, I think, now is not so much that the medical profession is unwilling to open its mind to traditional medicine. I mean, there will be some, some groups that are not, but I think generally the medical profession has, been, has opened up quite a bit. But more so that many of the traditional practitioners are not willing to, be, to take part in uh, sort of developing scientific evidence or going into clinical trials. I think there's, there's still that lack of trust over there. And hopefully with time it will get better. But in many uh, hospitals and medical practices, in fact, uh, they have already adopted many traditional practices where the scientific basis has been shown uh, to, be, to be good. I mean, for example, acupuncture, for example, is quite widely practiced in many so-called Western types of practices. All right? And there, there is enough scientific evidence to show that it does work. So where it, there is evidence, I think we are comfortable in adopting it. There are lots of people who come to me and say they want uh, us to promote certain uh, types of practices which they say it works very well and so on, but they are still not willing to subject themselves to um, a trial so that we can find a scientific basis. I think you did ask something about the 1090 gap on uh, research spending and how it is that gross disparity between the amount spent and the burden of disease. I think this, there have been many groups that, that are trying to look into research capacity building to address the 1090 gap. But it boils down to a lot of capacity building in countries where they, in, in the low income countries, which really need to define their own research agenda. And they have to have commitment from the national governments to put a certain amount of funding into research that are unique to their own communities, as well as building up the research capacity of their own countries. Because to just depend on the global community, I mean, can you imagine someone, let's say a Europe funding agency, trying to um, put to so much money to, into researching a, a, a condition that's not common? In, in their own area, so why should they work on that? Although, I must say that with the opening of collaborations, and I, that's why in one of my slides I say collaborations are making a difference. With global collaborations, some of these research capacity gaps can be filled by partnerships with, with, um, with researchers from countries that have an expertise that the low-income countries may not have. And then they can explore things and uh, go for joint funding. Nowadays, this, the world has opened up a lot with collaborations. So we're hoping that this 1090 gap will, will be closed in, in due course. It is not closed, but it is something that's recognized. There are big groups working on it. I'm sure the Blacher has a lot to say because they have a lot of work on traditional medicine. They have quite a bit on the 1090 gap, a research capacity building as well. One more I think you mentioned is, is regarding the conflict of interest. And this, I think the public has pointed out many times. They think that doctors and farmers, pharmaceuticals are hand in glove in getting benefits from pharmaceutical companies to sponsor them to conferences and uh, cruises or whatever, and opera houses or that, and bring their families along. Uh, I think the, the medical community recognizes that this is a very negative aspect in their image and many countries uh, have emphasized regarding conflicts of interest and ethics, professional ethics. I think almost all medical councils will not accept this kind of behavior, kickbacks, uh, and so on, because in the end it boils down to drugs being more expensive because you have to cover for the cost of uh, bringing doctors on holidays and so on. So it is slowly changing. I wouldn't say slowly, I would think it's quite rapidly changing. 
certainly in countries like Malaysia where I work, which is not a developed country, there is a major clampdown on the, uh, accepting uh, funding from the pharmaceuticals to, you know, for 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 conferences and so on. So it it could make a difference in the end. I think it's all boils down boils down to ethics. I think the core of that is anything will be accepted if it's well studied and understood. So you ask the question, what can we do? I think we just need to promote people doing research in the area and documenting one way or the other. And this includes alternative ways of providing healthcare by non-medical professionals, etc. I mean, everywhere this happens, but unless you have an evidence, you will not be able to convince the politician who is going to put the money that he can get X, Y, and Z for half of the price, but he needs to or she needs to get that information. So uh, otherwise, the, I mean, the medical community will love them, we hate them because we have to live with them because that's where you're going to go tomorrow to the hospital. So it, 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 it's always going to be like that. So the more we understand and the more we have, I mean, there are a, millions of examples of where um, look, even midwives or nurses in, in high-income countries were not considered to be high sort of health professionals until recently, and now they practice on themselves without, you know, any supervision by doctors. So this happens, but only when you have good evidence to show that you can deliver your baby by a with midwife without a doctor with the same success with the same result. So the, the answer to your question is, good research showing the, the success of these things. That's the only thing one can do. So I will be very quick. I have an announcement to make and a question, and the announcement is that inspired by IAMP and by Professor Krieger, the Brazilian National Academy of Science is implementing a program of young physician leaders, and uh, we want to extend this program to become a Latin America program of young physician leaders. So my question is, uh, how do you follow up the activities of those young physician leaders linked to IAMP, and if you know of other initiatives of this, uh, that other academies in different countries are or are not uh, establishing such a program? And to Gary, just a very quick question. How do you follow up and uh, evaluate the implementation research uh, activities that you are nowadays uh, sponsoring? Thank you. Thank you. Bianca? Blanca. I will try to be short, but uh, I hope the replies won't be short. <laughs> First of all, thank you. I think that uh, from this panel, it was very clear to me that uh, uh, the role that science has to play because uh, SDGs and the Water for Future agenda are, at the end, targets very useful for politicians, but uh, it is still the, uh, what we are proposing there is very narrow because the problem is much more complex. It has to do with ethics. It has to do with many things. The second is a comment, to, and the third is a question, both related, on this uh, contribution of science that we have to do at the long term, and has to do with the antibiotics. Something has to be done uh, in your area, in many other areas, because antibiotics, we are, we are finding them in water, along many other compounds, and we know these are having effects on uh, fauna and on uh, biota, we don't know if they have uh, effects on humans. And in the field of the water, we are not going to remove them because our treatments are not meant to that and are very costly to remove them. So you need to do something, whatever you would like to do. And, uh, they, but that, that's, uh, that's a big problem. Some of these compounds, uh, which are part of the emerging pollutants, have been found that are changing the sex of some uh, animals. So, there is a problem there. The third is a question. I would uh, try to be politically correct, so maybe I won't be very clear. 
but it has to do with all these epidemias and the Ebola and the H1N1 and all these issues. Is somebody, and I think the, the, that should be a job for the science, is somebody assessing the cost of these decisions? In Mexico City, we have this problem of the H1N1. The epidemic was not that wrong, and it cost us a lot of money. And I know that each disease is different, but the cost is being paid by developing countries. So, in there, there is an ethical issue. When we uh, said this is a disease that should be banned and we have to uh, have all these constraints for people, people start uh, facing uh, problems of racism. Where is the community in there protecting all these people? Where are the rights of these people? Why, sh why should poor people pay to protect people from other countries? Thank you for giving me the opportunity. Um, my question is one on the ethical one. Um, Professor Ruby um, mentioned about the global package of essential services, uh, which would be, um, uh, would be the basis for universal health services. And I was wondering, I mean, even though the idea of everyone in all over the world being having access to all sorts of medicine is very, very idealistic and a nice one. We all know it is impossible because of finance. With the advance of te um, on the medical te technology and also population aging, we cannot provide the same medical practice that is practiced in New York to everyone in the whole world. So we would have to set the line of basic services that would be covered for all. But as long as, um, my question is, if we start doing that, then we would start having first class medicine and second class medicine. And would that be, would that be something that as a science community, I mean, I'm sure bureaucrats and governments would like to set that, but as a science community, should we promote that? Or, but, and if we do decide to do that, is there any way that in any scientific criteria that says what is luxurious medicine and what is essential medicine? The question is really in another zone, but it's, I think it's important, but it's another zone, and you've had three quite heavy-duty questions already, so I feel I'll back off and ask them maybe this afternoon in the same area, but okay. I think my panel friends have enough on their plate with these three questions. Yeah. Okay. Uh, because we're running out of time, I'm going to give just short comments, kind of answers. YPL in Brazil, fantastic. That's what we want to see happen. It is important to develop leadership among young physicians because they are the ones who are going to tackle the changing world. And we need leadership qualities to be able to cope with that. How do we follow up activities of YPL? At the IMP level, we have developed a website specifically for them so that they can connect to each other because this is a very important network among them. They have never met be each other before until they come to the workshop, but they develop very, very firm friendships, and these are friendships for life from all over the world. Can you imagine the power of such a network? So we create the network for them. We use whatever tools we have now, simple things like just a website for them to connect, and they form an alumni group. We involve them back in the next round of workshops that we do. We always call back a few. And also, we are developing more activities, IMP activities, where we invite them to come back. So we integrate them back into their national academies and into IMP. And we challenge their own national academies to adopt them into their academies. So at the moment, that's roughly what we do. We also encourage them into our projects. If we have projects, we invite them. We want to develop statements. I think the feeling now is we invite them to also help us develop statements. So that's one. Do I need to comment on others? No, all, all, the comments. all comments. Antibiotics in the environment, I think, yes, that's a very important area. I don't have any answers. I think we need dialogue to talk about a strategy on, on what to do about in antibiotics, other substances, pollutants, elements, toxins, and so on. It's a very big area. Um, 
outbreaks, epidemics, how do we cost all these? <laughs> I think the economists have to answer that. I, it is important to cost. But I'd like to use that opportunity to mention that in principle, in medical practice, prevention is better than cure. It is better to learn the message of these outbreaks, that we should try to prevent the outbreaks. And we should have a better surveillance system when things go wrong in the environment, uh, when something goes wrong with the ecosystem, when wildlife starts dying, when farm animals start dying for no reason. We should be exploring all these, and these messages should filter up in dialogues, regular dialogues and meetings, uh, between the agricultural area, the wildlife people, surveillance system, so that we know that there may be an outbreak, uh, something is going to happen and prevent it. So we need surveillance systems. And with that, I'll submit the appeal for more interest in the One Health Initiative. One Health Initiative, you can look it up, that we should really be talking a lot more between different professional groups rather than working in silos, that the medical people work in medicine and agriculture, in agriculture, veterinary, and we don't talk to each other. I think that's a disaster. I think we should learn from the outbreaks that we shouldn't do that. Uh, uh, Abhi's a question on the essential services, would it mean that two tiers, a higher class, lower class? To some extent, it does happen because um, the rich will be able to buy a more comfortable service. And uh, they will be able to assess the latest treatment available in New York or Mayo Clinic or UK compared to the poor who cannot afford to do that. But I think it is nevertheless the responsibility of government to, and health professions to talk about what is a, 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 a comprehensive enough essential service so that everybody should not have to suffer. They, they should be able to reach uh, an acceptable um, range or package of essential service at an affordable rate. And then for high cost treatments that are needed, there should be a system of protection, or perhaps subsidies, I don't know. I mean, I'm not an economist and I'm not exactly the government, but certainly they should have to talk about when, when they need a very expensive treatment that's beyond their costs. There should be some kind of scheme that allows such a person who is of a low income level, socioeconomically is beyond that person's reach, but there should be means, perhaps through, through, through public funds to help out people like that, some kind of protection. Uh, and also, I think it's inherent on the medical scientists to use whatever technologies are available to bring down health costs. For example, I practice in pathology. I would say that if we don't have the expertise to make a difficult diagnosis, there's no digital pathology available. And it's getting better and better. We should avail ourselves of these methods, communication, where perhaps you do not have to make it very expensive to get a particular diagnostic um, opinion because of the networks that we have that use technologies that can be very rapid and give you pretty good, uh, high-class, um, good-level answers. A very uh, short uh, answer. Um, any implementation research, at the end of the day, the goal is a health outcome, is what we measure. Um, and it can be bad or good, doesn't matter. Uh, the, the goal of that research is improve health outcome. So that's how we measure. And, and sometimes it doesn't happen, sometimes it happens. So it, the, the, outcome, the result is not, um, not, nothing special. So I hope it answered your question. In terms of the epidemics and all of that, um, the government has to buy some kind of insurance and go stand out there and say that they're doing something. But the trick is not in that, the trick is in a way where the communities can convince the government to do something in advance so you don't get there. And that is not done often. So um, the idea is to put public health as part of sort of political policy development um, scene where monies are put into prevention rather than after that 
the politician has to do something. And I don't blame them because it, it's an insurance that they have to buy by saying that they've done something so they don't, you know, get stoned next day. Um, I'd like to just add one or two things to the IAMP program. Um, I've been lucky to be part of the program from the exemption. And in Nigeria now, we have uh, a total of eight people who have attended. They formed themselves into a group. and They are working hard to develop and mentor other people and show how they can connect with outside bodies. Secondly, there is a mentorship program whereby the uh, people who have been on the program are attached to members of the committee or members of the academy who follow them and they become quite friendly. And uh, I had a mentor who came from Bangladesh and she became a very good friend. Um, unfortunately, I keep saying she decided to leave Bangladesh and go on to live permanently in America because of um, family ties and things like that. But basically, there is a program that allows the um, participants to be followed, further mentorship, develop a program among themselves so that they can attract and then have an enlarging circle of uh, people in their group. As for first class or second class or third class medicine, uh, it's a natural phenomenon. There is a minimum basic that everybody will be there will be others who will be able to buy more and those who are not able to buy more. But there ought to be a basic minimum and that will vary from place to place depending on the level of development, the amount of money that is available within that community, also the amount of expertise that can be given. Uh, and in my place they say that if you look at the fingers of your hand, they are not all equal. God made it particularly so. So one is tall, one is long, the other is a little bit shorter. But they are basically have a certain length that they are functional. I think that's where we have to pitch it. There is no way we are going to be able to provide the same level of health for everybody on a public system. Uh, it will never happen. Thank you. Okay, before I finish, let me say that it was a pity that we couldn't uh, have the collaboration of Paulo Booth because he will present the experience of Brazil in universal health coverage that is very exciting because it's a country of 200 million people and by law we need to, to give a, a health coverage for each one of our people. But uh, the organizer told me that uh, we will try to, to, to also include his presentation in, in, the, in the book, in the, in the, in the, in the publication of the, of the meeting. So, thank you very much for all the, the leaders, the audience. And before we end, I want to announce that we have with us now the president of the uh, National Academy of Medicine of Brazil, Pietro Novellino. Please, I applaud. Okay, thank you very much.